Hey, welcome to the Uproar Live YouTube page. We are excited that you are gonna be joining in and watching this message. We know it's gonna be encouraging, we know it's gonna be inspiring, and we know that it's gonna be life-changing. So go ahead and share this with a friend. Don't keep it to yourself, but share the good word. While you're at it, go ahead and like and subscribe to our page so that you can get updated when we post new content each and every week. Last but certainly not least, if while you're watching, you want to get connected and or you want to sow into our ministry, we have multiple ways for you to do just that. Check out our description for more options and select the one that works best for you. Now let's go ahead and check out this message. How many, if you could be honest, you know, you love all the people that God has placed around you. You know, you would ride or die with them, give them the shirt off your back. But if you could be honest, how many have some friends or some family members in your life that sometimes make you just, you know, want to go at them a little bit? You know, they have a way of saying the wrong things at the wrong time. They, they, they have a way of, of changing your temperature. And what do I mean by changing your temperature? They, they, they have a way of controlling your room. They have a way of changing your emotions. They can take you from up here to down here just like that. And, you know, we, we got to do life with those kind of people. You can't not experience those kind of relationships. Everybody is going to have somebody or some people like that. You can't control that. That's life. Now, when it comes to my personal space, when I'm looking to have a good time, I really try to keep those kind of people away. That's just being honest. But every now and then, someone or someone will do something that, that creeps in that'll change the temperature in my setting. For instance, I, I would never call them out and disrespect them like this, but I, I have this one friend who every Sunday... We tend to go out and we, we have a debriefing about service. We go out and we have lunch and we talk about what went right and, and what went wrong. And, and we talk about, you know, who's up and coming and who's shining as far as staff goes and, and what we can fix for next week and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about the worship. We'll talk about the graphics. We'll talk about the first time guests. And we just have this debrief to set the tone for the, for the following week. And we do this every week. And I got this one friend who I, I started noticing it a few months ago, but they started doing this thing and maybe they've done it for years. I just never caught it, but they started doing this thing when I was eating or when others were eating where their face would change when we put something like ketchup on something. And it was this look like of disgust. You know, and, and I had to look over one day and say, Colleen, I mean, I'm sorry, I said her name. Why are you all in our plates? I mean, faces and like, oh, like if I want to put hot sauce on this, I'll put hot sauce on this. If I want to ask for steak sauce, I'll ask for steak sauce. And it was always these faces. And it began to make me feel funny about my food. And I got to the place where I said something and the response was, I just think that's disgusting. And now in my mind, I'm like, well, what would happen if I commented on certain outfits you wore or people you dated in the past? You know, if we're going to go there, let's go there. But this is my, my food. Like, let me eat without making me feel bad about what I'm hungry for. And what my appetite is. Right. It's just the face. And sometimes they can say something like, ooh, or whatever. But, but there is power in facial expressions. And when it comes to my food, I don't feel the need to have to explain to anyone what I'm in the mood for, what I am hungry for. But isn't that the case, though, with life, if we're not careful? We will allow looks and criticism to make us feel bad about what we are hungry for. And when I say hunger, I'm not just talking about food, but hunger concerning the things you like, 
Hunger concerning the places that you like to go. Hunger for the things that maybe God has wired you to want. And if we're not careful, we start to hate our lives because we allow everybody to take control of our happiness. I wonder today how many people have allowed somebody or even some people to hijack your happiness. You're trying so bad to make everybody happy and they walk away happy and you walk away miserable. They get the best of you and you have to go home with the you that you don't even like to live with because of their faces, because of their words, because of their text messages, because of their posts. And my goal today before you leave is to get you to the place where you finally start to love you. The way you like to do your hair, the way you like to do your makeup, the way you don't like to do your hair, the way you don't like to do your makeup, how you like to dress, how you don't like to dress, where you like to eat, what you don't like to eat. It's to get you to finally like you. You really cannot be free until you love you. As long as you don't love you, you are always going to feel like your life has been hijacked. One of the baddest scriptures is in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, when Paul says this, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Oh, how freeing that is. I am what I am. I am what I am. I'm not changing. I've, Paul is saying, I've finally gotten to the place where I don't feel bad about me. I like me. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to become what you want me to be to make you happy. By the grace of God, I am what I am. The scripture says that every one of us is fearfully and wonderfully or marvelously made. The Bible says, marvelous are God's works. My soul knoweth right well. Everything about you was intentional. When God was creating the earth, in six days, he, he created, seventh day, he rested. But there was not one thing he created that he said was bad. From, from day one to day six, everything God created was good. I'm going to talk about this on Wednesday night. The only thing God complained about, he did complain once. The only thing God complained about in the six days of creation was that Adam was alone. It's not good that man be alone. That's the only thing God complained about. And guess what he did? He fixed it. But everything God created, when he was done, he said it was good. This is how God is able to work all things together for the good. Because everything he makes is good. But why is it that God makes things good and we often don't see it? We often miss it because we're not looking at the good. We tend to focus on the things that went wrong. Not realizing that even the things that went wrong were part of the plan. God is, the Bible says he works everything after the counsel of his will. That scripture is saying this, when God is thinking about your life or when God was laying out your life, he didn't pull counsel together. He didn't ask Michael the archangel what he should do. He, he didn't ask Gabriel what he should do. He didn't consult with a pastor or a priest. No, no, no. The Bible says after the counsel of his will. That means when God was laying out your life, the only one he consulted with was himself. 
And when God was consulting with himself, he began to lay out a life for you. And yes, some things were bad. And yes, some things you probably wish didn't happen. But, but God knew what he was doing because he was qualifying you for the good thing he brought you into this world to do. And before it's all said and done, you will see how he works all things together for the good because everything that you've been through was a part of the rest for the good life he's going yes. to give you. Amen. Amen. But what about the bad sides of me? Well, remember on day one, when God said, let there be light, he saw the light and the darkness, the day and the night. And he still said it is good. God knows your light side and God knows your shady side. God knows your dark side. God knows your habits. God knows your nasty stuff. God knows your worst mistakes. He knows your night and he knows your hallelujah and thank you, Jesus. And I praise you, Lord. He knows your night and he knows your day. He knows your light. And every time he sees you, every time you wake up, every time you start your day, every time you go to bed, there is never a moment that God looks at you and does not say that you are a good thing, that you are a destined thing. That you are a perfect thing in, in, his, in his eyes. Because he does not make mistakes. So by the grace of God, I am what I am. Say, I am what I am. Say, I am what I am. I tell people all the time, don't try to do life with me if who I am is not enough. I am not your project. You are not coming into my life to pray to make me better. If you cannot accept me for who I am, please don't let the door hit you on your way out. Because I am what I am. Every person in here will tell you they did not get into a relationship with you to be parented. By the grace of God, I am what I am. If you can't respect me, stay away from me. Because I am what I am. I've learned this about God. God will never bless who we pretend to be. He will always bless who you really are. And maybe the reason you have not been blessed is because when God sees you, he doesn't recognize you. We know everything about everybody else. I can name a celebrity in the news right now and you know all the details about everything they did wrong. We know more about others than we do about ourselves. Who are you? Jacob, you want to be blessed? What's your name? Uh, 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 Jacob? No. That's the name they gave you. I call you Israel. This is why often you would see God come in and change people's names. Because they would start to live based upon what people were calling them. And whenever you start to live based upon what people have called you, your life will always spiral out of control. Anybody that hears more than one voice is crazy. So you have people that help guide you so that certain tendencies don't leak out and cost you opportunities. That's mentorship. That's discipleship. That's having somebody in your life to hold you accountable. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the average people in your life who, whose voices should not have weight that keep making you hate the you. That God created. Until you figure out who you are and love that person. You will never figure out your pattern. What is your pattern? That's my first question today. What is your pattern? Everybody's life has a pattern. If I, you've heard me say this before, just let me talk to those that haven't heard it. 
When God created the tabernacle, he told Moses to build according to the pattern. Everybody's life has a pattern. If you don't know your pattern, you don't know what you're building. Your pattern will tell you who you need to date. Your pattern will tell you who you need to marry. Your pattern will tell you what jobs you need to go to. Your pattern will show you what church is for you. Once you know your pattern, you know who to add into your life. You know who you still need in your life. You also begin to realize who you need to let go of in your life because you're building according to your pattern. If you don't know who you are, you will never know how to build your life. And if you don't know how to build your tabernacle, how can you get mad when the glory never shows up? So what's your pattern? Remember David on the battlefield, Saul put his armor on David and David tried it on and it, it was a little clanky and a little big. And what did David say to Saul? I can't wear your armor. Why? Because I have not proven it. It's not me. Give me my little bag. Give me five little rocks. I'll do more with this than with your armor. Why? Because as long as I stick to my pattern, giants have to fall. As long as I stick to my pattern, I cannot lose. My pattern may not give me as much to work with as you have, but my pattern will promise me victory after victory after victory. If, if I try to be like you, I may go out here and lose. But David said, Saul, I have to stick to my pattern. What is your pattern? And next, who are you? Do you know who you are? Do you know your name? Do you know what God sees when God sees you? Because if you don't know who you are, people are going to tell you who you are. And if you haven't established who you are, you know what you're going to do? You're going to believe them. You're going to believe what she said you were. What she said you was. You, you, you're going to believe what he says you are. Who, who he says you are. Because you don't know who you are. There's power in knowing who you are. This is why Paul said through Christ, I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I, I, I. Don't minimize that I. We know what Christ can do. But if you don't know who you are, he'll never be able to do it through you. Paul says it's a partnership between me and God. It's his strength, which is proven. We can look around and see his strength. We can look back and see his strength over our lives. We can see his strength in our family. We can see his strength in our money. But the question is not whether or not God can strengthen or God has strength. The question is, do you believe in yourself enough to say, I can do all things? If you don't believe in yourself, you'll keep talking about God's greatness, but you'll never put I in there. Say, who are you? Through Jesus' whole upbringing, people were trying to tell him who he was. Remember when he got started, what did they say to him? This is Joseph's boy. This is Joseph's boy. Who are you to speak like this? Is this not Joseph the carpenter's son? When Jesus was trying to get started, they were trying to tell him who he was. He did an audit one day and said, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're Elias. Everybody was trying to box him in by giving him a title. Because if I say you're like Jeremiah, that means the minute you do something Jeremiah wouldn't, you're out of line. Because whenever people can't control you, they, they, they tend to try to put labels on you. Who do men say that I am? 
And this is what helped him in the wilderness when the devil kept trying to throw things at him that, that, were, that were not his in that season. Turn this rock into bread. If you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, jump off this temple. If you're the son of God, bow down and worship me. If you're the son, if you're the son, if you're the son. The reason the devil could not trick Jesus is because right before the wilderness in the Jordan River, his father said, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Since Jesus knew his identity, he did not bite the tricks of the enemy. Once you begin to realize who you are, the devil can't trick you no more. The devil can't get you to try to turn rocks into bread anymore. The devil can't try to get you to turn things into things they're never supposed to be. The devil won't be able to get you to bow down. The devil won't be able to get you to jump off opportunities. Why? Because you know who you are. Do you know? who you are and side note Jacob would say this the minute you know who you are your life changes forever because the minute my name changes and I find out who I am for the rest of my life I will walk with a limp you can always tell when somebody has discovered who they are because everything about their walk begins to change. And today we're going to see through Esther that if she did not have a strong sense of who she was, she would have missed out on the opportunity that her whole life was turned upside down for. I shared last week how Esther's life as a little girl was completely wrecked. It says in Esther chapter 2, right around verse 5, it talks about how she came into her situation being raised by Mordecai. It tells us that Esther, her name was Hadassah, that was her original name. Hadassah means prosperous or a myrtle tree. Myrtle trees are tied to prosperity. Her name means prosperous. But nothing about her life meant or resembled prosperity. Her mother died. Her father died. You, you cannot have in my way, in my mind, a more traumatic experience as a child than losing both of your parents. Your parents are the ones that protect you. Your parents are the ones that really give you or bestow values in you. Your parents are the ones that show you how to carry yourself with dignity. Your mother as a little girl shows you how to be a woman and not just how to be a woman as far as getting nails done and hair done, because that, that's not even the, 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 the top keys of being a woman. Your mother teaches you what to look for, how to spot stuff. Your mother teaches you how to take care of yourself as a young girl. Esther had to go through life as far as being a female. She had to go through life without a playbook. And it's hard to be something that you never saw modeled. There are people in here that are trying to be a good husband. It's hard to be a great husband when you've never seen one modeled. It's hard to be a great wife when you've never seen one modeled. It's hard to handle money when you've never seen money handled. It's, it's hard to rise to the top of a business or a company when, when you never lived in a home where somebody modeled that to you. It almost, in a way, when you've never had great things modeled before you, it almost seems like your life becoming great is just a fairy tale. Because if I've seen it modeled before me, I can become it. But what do you do when you've never seen the life that you know God promised you? What do you do when you've never seen that modeled before? 
Esther missed out on so many memories. She didn't have her mother. And yes, God gave her Mordecai to raise her, her cousin. But it's different than having your father. It's different crying in a stranger's lap or a family member's lap when it's not your father. It's hard for a little girl not to have a mother. And the reason I, I'm, I'm taking my time on this is because I want you to see that even though her childhood was traumatic, even though the first half of her life was traumatic, God was setting her up for the second half. God was preparing her for what he had in store for her. This is why, to me, one of the greatest tragedies in life is to never get serious for God. Because if you never get serious for God, you'll never understand all of the things that happened in your life. So while Esther's being raised by Mordecai, the Bible gives us a little bit of details about Esther. It says that she had a lovely figure and she was beautiful. I said last week, you know you're bad when God brags on your figure. And I'm not going to lie, I've seen some, some bad figures in my life. But very seldom do you see a bad figure with a good face. <laughs> you know. And nowadays, you can buy a bad figure, <laughs> you know. She had a bad figure, and she had a beautiful face. That's what God has to say about Esther. In, in other words, when God looked at her, he said, it is good. It is good. While Esther is growing up on this side of the city, on the other side of the city, a problem is brewing. Always understand that whenever God is raising you up, he's always raising you up to solve a problem. Don't run from problems. He is raising you up to solve a problem. Esther had no idea that that would be the case. But on the other side of the city, the king, Xerxes, is having a problem with his marriage. He's throwing a party and he wants to show his wife off. His wife refuses to come out because she has her own party within the party. And she will not allow him to come call her on her just to show her off. And I shared last week how often what this was was a submission issue. And often when we battle submitting to God, we are forfeiting God being able to show our lives off. We are the city set on a hill that can't be hid. But if we're not in position, how can God show us off? The king wanted to show Vashti, his wife, off, but she was not in position. And the king had to move on. He had to move on because if he allowed this to go, it would have reproduced through the kingdom. The king loved Vashti. I said last week how he got angry when he had to leave her. You only get angry about what you care about. He loved her, but he had to make a decision because she was going to affect his kingdom. And so the show had to move on. And God has done this through the Bible, whether it's King Saul, he moved on from to raise up David, or whether it was Judas and he brought in Matthias. God's agenda never stops for people that are not in position. So he moved on. And this is where our story picks up today. He begins to call on all the virgins from around the land of Babylon. And they begin to go through a 12-month process of being trained to be queens. They're sitting in spas and getting oil treatments, the Bible says. 
They're being trained to be queens. They're, they're being trained on etiquette, when to stand, when to sit. They're being trained on how to walk into a room and how to walk out of the room. They're being trained on how to stand next to the king and what not to do when you're next to the king. It's 12 months of being trained because every new level requires new training. It's 12 months. But, but look at what it says. It says, when, when the order or the edict went out and was proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther was taken to the king's palace and trusted to Haggai, who had charge over the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in harem. Look at how before she ever gets to the palace, favor is finding her. See, when you start walking with God... Don't get so caught up on the destination that you miss all the favor that's been following you along the way. Sometimes if we're not careful, we won't praise God and thank God for the favor that he's given us along the way. We're so focused on the destination that we don't realize God's been good to me for a long time. God was good to me as a child. God was good to me in my 20s. God's been good to me in my 30s. God's been good to me in my 40s. Somebody's saying he hasn't been good to me. Well, maybe it's because you don't see the cancer that he stopped that you never knew you had. Maybe it's because you don't realize he's the reason you got out of that relationship and it broke your heart, but he was tired of you being abused. Maybe it was his favor all over your life when you lost the one job and you got the better job. God's favor has been all over your life since you came out of your mother's womb. Say favors on me. The favor was on her like Joseph. Every place Joseph went in the Bible, he rose to the top. Whether it was in Potiphar's house, whether it was in the prison or with Pharaoh, you could not put Joseph in a place where he did not rise to the top. You know that favor is on your life by the fact that everywhere God places you, everything you step into, all you can do is be a star. Esther is coming in and being signaled out by the keeper of the women. And the keeper does not just put her in the best place to live. He gives her seven servants to move when she needs them. Look at how she's, she's beginning to be blessed like a queen before she ever gets the title. And the time comes when all the women have to now go before the king. 12 months of training. 12 months of learning protocol and etiquette. 12 months. And Haggai says to the women to, to pick what they want to wear and to take the gift that they want to give to the king. Now, understand this. The king does not know Esther's upbringing. The king does not even know she's Jewish. For it says in verse 10 that Mordecai commanded her that she did not tell the king that she was Jewish, that she did not tell the king her original name, Hanessa, for he, he told her to call herself Esther, he said, Esther is your new name when the king asks. And I said last week, Esther means a star in the making. So she steps into the palace. The 12 months of training is up. And it says in verse 14 that none of the women could go before the king unless... He summoned them by name. He knows my. In order for the woman to come before the king, the king had to 
say their name. If the king did not know your name, he did not care. If the king did not know your name, you went back home. If the king did not know your name, you can forget about the life you've been exposed to. You will go back to the life you've always had. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But I've learned in life, it doesn't matter who knows my name if God doesn't know my name. If God knows my name, I'll never go back to how he found me. If God knows my name, promotion is what my life is going to be all about. If, if God knows my name, everything about me is getting ready to change. If God knows my name, it doesn't matter how you found me. I won't be there for long. If God knows my name, my relationships are changing. If God knows my name, let, let me bring it a little bit more modern. If God knows your name, sickness will not stay in your body. If God knows your name, you won't be single forever. If God knows your name, this marriage is going to have a turn. If God knows your name, so money is coming into your life if God knows your name your desire is going to come to pass if God knows your name you are going to be the head and not the tail above and not beneath if God knows your name you don't have to cry no more you don't have to stay depressed any longer because if God knows your name your life the Bible says, do not despise the day, a small beginning, because when God calls your name, it is your turn, it is your opportunity, and it is your season to step in everything that God has for your life. Say he knows my name. The only thing that matters is, does the king know your name? And the job of Haggai was to prepare them so that the king would remember them. His job was to prepare them so that the king would take a chance on them. So he showed them how to get ready. And he taught them how to take a gift before the king. For the Bible says this. A man's gift maketh room for him and taketh him before great people. When I was in Abuja some years back and uh, Nigeria, and when I was there, it was shocking at the hotel that I was staying at because when we were walking through the hallways, Everybody was bringing all of these gifts. And when we went to the church service, the church was giving all of these gifts. And I didn't understand it. And then it was explained to me, Proverbs 15, 18. And it was explained that you cannot expect to be in the room of greatness and have your name remembered if you don't bring a gift. It is your gift, Proverbs 18, 16. It is your gift that gets you in the room. Yeah. So if you never bring a gift, you don't get the opportunity. You don't get the connection. And that's what we do every single week before our king when we give tithes and offerings. We are bringing a gift for our king. And we are trusting that king, if you see my gift, you're making room for me in this season. Do we minimize the power of the gifts that we bring to God? Haggai had the responsibility to teach them. You do not go before the king empty handed if you want to wear a crown. If you want to go back to your old life 
and your regular normal, keep insulting the king. But if you want the king to see you, if you want the king to give you an opportunity, show the king that you value his presence by never coming into his presence empty-handed. So Haggai got them ready. He showed them how to carry themselves in the presence of the king. Because they needed their name to be remembered. Haggai's job was to make sure that they are remembered. And it says that the king only remembered one name when it was all said and done. It says when it was Esther's time. Esther's. The girl, you know, the young woman who lost her mother and father. The, the woman Mordecai adopted. God, God wants you to see that again. As if we didn't read it about 10 verses earlier. God wants this in parentheses to remind us of her trauma. To, to remind us of her upbringing. God wants us to see that again, just in case we, we didn't read it 10 verses earlier. I want you to remember that this, this girl is coming before the king who lost both her parents. This girl is coming before the king who had a traumatic childhood. Th this girl is coming before the king that lived in Susan, which was the worst part of town. This, this girl is coming before the king whose life was wrecked. I think that God wants this emphasized to remind us that you don't have to have the best life to get a big opportunity. That everything does not have to be perfect. It says when, when the turn, this is why I love this here. When, when the turn, when the turn, when the turn, when, when the turn came, look at somebody say, it's my turn. See, when it's your turn, it doesn't matter what you've done. When it's your turn, it doesn't matter what your history looks like. When, it, when it's your turn, it doesn't matter how many things went wrong. When it's your turn, it doesn't matter how unqualified you are. When it's your your turn it doesn't matter what addictions you wrestle with when it's your turn it doesn't matter how many bedrooms you've been in when it's your turn it doesn't matter if you never went to college when it's your turn God is going to bring all of you to the table my past and my present all of it is going to be used when it's my turn and none of it can stop me from stepping into my turn it says when the turn came. Yes. See, you've been getting frustrated about your life rather than saying, Lord, just give me my turn. Yes. You keep telling God about how underqualified you are rather than saying, God, give me my turn. My turn. My turn. My turn. But here's the thing. Are you strong enough to see your turn as somebody else's loss? Because yes, it's Esther's turn, but I can promise you that stalking her Instagram page will be Queen Vashti. See, when God allows you to step into your turn, it doesn't matter what yesterday thinks about it. Because when it's your turn, this is what God has been allowing your whole life to build you up to. Your turn. Now when the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai adopted the daughter of his uncle Abihel to go to the king. She asked for nothing. Nothing other than what Haggai had recommended. What did he recommend? The gift that she had to take to the king. 
What is the nothing? She didn't want to wear makeup. She didn't want to wear her hair like all the other girls. She didn't want to dress like all the other women. She wanted nothing. 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 You can be down to nothing and God will use you. She wanted nothing. Why? Because I came from nothing. And nothing is where I shine. Nothing is where I experience God. Nothing is where I've seen signs, miracles, and wonders. I got here from nothing. How many can look at your life and say, I've come from nothing. I didn't have the best childhood. I came from nothing. I haven't been used to a lot of money. I come from nothing. My mom wasn't there. I come from nothing. My dad wasn't there. I come from nothing. I didn't have the best education. I come from nothing. Esther said, I don't want nothing because I serve the God that does his best work when I am down to nothing. Take me down to nothing. All I will do is rise. Take me down to nothing. That's how I get my crown. To all the people that feel like you're down to nothing in this season, God says, it's with nothing you came from and it's with nothing that you're going to step in to your finest Jesus, say I'm okay with nothing. Take my money, take my house, take my car, take my retirement, take my 401k. Keep taking me down to nothing because it is with nothing that I will step in to my palace season. Say I'm down to nothing. It was with nothing, she said. I'm going to step into this with nothing. I'm going to step into this like David taking off Saul's armor. I don't want nothing. And the girls would say, Esther, you're crazy. This is the king. Girl, you, you got to put some makeup on. You, you got to put one of these silky dresses on. Come on, girl, spray some of this on. Why are you refusing to do it like us? And because Esther has been prepared for this her whole life, she was able to go into the king, but also tell them that I don't owe you no explanation. See, once you come to grips and have a respect for your upbringing, you won't allow people to get you to become something that could cost you not having your name remembered by the king. She said, I want nothing. She stepped into it with herself. And it says, and she won the favor of everyone that saw her. Not just the king. See, the other women were so focused to get to the top that they stepped on everybody along the way. But when God is really preparing you for something, the Bible says that God will give you favor both with him and with man. She was not just favored in Haggai's court as she's stepping into her purpose. She is gaining the favor of everybody in her line to meet the king because she is going into her destiny as herself. You're so busy trying to be what everybody wants you to be that you don't understand. This is what's causing the king to not remember your name. And God is saying, I raised you. I allowed those things to happen to get you to the place where you love you. She won the favor of everybody, it says, who saw her. And, and, and as it goes on, look at what it says. 
It says, and when the king saw her, it says, he was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. Look at how her being herself calls the right person to love her. Can you imagine what young Esther or Hadassah would have thought if somebody told her, one day you're going to marry the king? She would have probably said, little girl, I'm going to have to dress this way and be this way. And I'm definitely going to have to do what all the other pretty girls are doing. Who would have thought this girl who only knew brokenness? would have the king of the land love her, think she's more beautiful than all the women that came in like models. When God has a purpose for your life, he will wire great people to see your potential. But he has wired them not to see who you pretend to be. He has wired them to love you. When's the last time you gave the world you? And maybe that's the reason love comes and goes. Because God is not going to let the you you pretend to be to captivate the love and the favor of people. It says the king was attracted to her with no makeup, with no perfume. The king was attracted to her more than any other woman. She won favor. She won approval more than any of the other virgins. And it says that he organized a whole party for her. He made a national holiday called Esther Day. Because when it's your turn, your party will be ready for you. So in this season, could God be telling somebody to stop feeling like you owe everybody an explanation? People often battle with changing. Well, how's this going to affect this person? And what are they going to think? What should I say to, to, to my mom? What should I say to my spouse? What should I say to my boyfriend, my girlfriend, the kids? I say often, personally, most of the things that God does in my life, I can't explain. I wish I could, but I can't explain it. Uh, things I don't allow in my house. If you were to say, well, why? I, I would say, I don't know why. <laughs> so to all the parents that need to explain everything to your children, it's going to be really hard if you got to explain things that you can't even understand. All I know is my Holy Spirit is telling me in this season, this can't happen no more. And maybe one day I'll be able to explain it and articulate it in 140 characters or less. But as of right now, I don't know other than I feel like God doesn't want this so. No explanation. When God is dealing with you, Sometimes the best thing to do is to say, I don't know. I just feel like God is leading me in this season. And sometimes I've had to cut people off and they'll say, but why? Tell me why you got to let me go. Tell me why you, you have to break up all of that kind of stuff. And the best answer I can say sometimes is all I know is the Lord is telling me you're not intended to be in my life for this next season. If you feel like he made a mistake, pray to him to change my heart. But at the end of the day, it's not about what you think about my name. It's that he knows my name. And that he calls me and allows me to step into my turn. Esther's whole life 
was choreographed. Esther's whole life was designed after God's counsel for his will. And if she did not bring all of her to the moment, if she tried to be like everybody else in the moment, she would have went back to her brokenness and never stepped into her moment where her crown was placed on her head. This is the season where your cross, as Jesus would say, transforms into a crown. This is the season where all the brokenness starts to make, make sense. I remember, as we bring this home now, I remember when I came here to Owings Mills, I met with a pastor who at the time, his church was way more popular than our church, way more known than our church. And I sat down with them to just kind of ask questions about the area. Also, I wanted to respect him by just letting him know, I'm coming here, this is our goal, this is our vision, our church is gonna be completely different than your church. You're a little, you know, Baptist style, we're gonna come in like this. And he told me, he said, you'll never grow a church in this area with, without a live band. And you notice we still don't have a live band, but that's what he told me. True story, told me that. He didn't tell me you'll never grow a church without having a great prayer life. You'll, you'll, never, have, you'll never grow a church, you know, with, with, without having a building. He said, no, you'll, you'll never grow a church here without a worship band. And I remember going home thinking, well, how much does a worship band cost? And I called some of my friends to say, you know, what would it cost for me to get a drummer, a bass player, uh, a keyboard player? You know, what would that cost? And my friend said, if you want it to be good, it's going to cost you about $1,500 a week to have a live band. And I said, okay. And he said, if you want singers, you're probably looking at about $3,000 a week for a worship experience. And I said, oh, Okay. So I, I looked at the $3,000 we didn't have, you know, and I said, okay, Lord, we could probably pull this together if we stop doing outreach, if we really just focus on having good church, we could do that. But that was like Saul's armor to me because God brought me from the gutter to go back to the gutter. God allowed me to struggle some nights for dinner as a young child with my mom. To have a heart for people that are struggling with having dinner. God allowed me to come up in the projects because I could relate to the children in the projects and know how valuable or how powerful it is to not just have a church, but to have men come into the community and just throw footballs. And that was one of those defining moments where I could have put on Saul's armor. But I said, Lord, I'm going to stick to who I am. And I'm going to bring my life story to my ministry and have a heart to reach the least, the lost, and the left out. And one day, soon, we're working on all that stuff now. But if I would have did that in the beginning, I would have felt like a counterfeit coming to church every week. Because it's not who I am. It's not what we've built this church on. We built this church on outreach. That's what we built it on. I don't bring in all preachers. I have every preacher's contact that you can think of. I've been to dinners with them. My spiritual father knows them all, counsels them all. I can literally call any singer, any preacher, and have them here on a Sunday morning. But do I want to spend $10,000 on a great speaker? Or use that in our budget to help 100 struggling moms through the week? Once you identify who you are, people can't pull you into what they think you should be. 
Do you know who you are? That's who I am. But who are you? Or do you not even know? Because so many people have raised their eyes and you turned. So many people have made faces when you made decisions that you stopped. So many people have pulled you up that you say, now why bother? And truthfully, the person that you see, it's hard for you to even recognize or respect because you pleased so many people along the way and where were those people when you needed them? And maybe today God is saying, in your season of turning, I want to get you back to your core. And I want you to become the person I always saw you becoming. Way before all the brokenness started. Her name was Hanessa when she was born. But right before her destiny, Mordecai changed her name to Esther. And he said, you will never go back to Hadessa. You will be Esther forever. Hadessa meant prosperity. Esther means star. Look at how her name was changed before her life-changing moment. She went from being prosperous to being a star. And God is saying the you that I've always seen to me has always been a star in the making. It's just, can this be the season where your name comes up? 